Exactly. So uh, I have lots of toys to pass around, so you guys need to come up here. Because it's not going to work with everybody scattered right now. Close your laptop. Turn your cell phone, your laptop off, or get out. And you won't want to have it on, please. Come up here, because look, I got toys. I got lots of toys. That's, that's all right. And that row is fine if you're leaning on a bike. But I have really good toys. Now, with these toys, these toys, there's, there's two things, this thing about engineer and the scientist. And, and I, don't, I don't get in that debate, because while those people are debating that, I'm out creating this stuff. But fundamentally, think of it as a spectrum. There's, a, there's people who do engineering who never write an equation, but people call them an engineer because they put together Legos. And then there's people who never do any Legos. All they do is gather data and analyze them and, and try to see what the data says. So it comes to extremes. But the real truth is, is that there's very little of this purity, and you shouldn't care, and most of the action's in the middle. Where a real engineer is going to solve problems they're going to use math to help them solve the problems. And I'll show you and tell you why. And in the context of solving the problems, when they have things they can't answer, but they're good enough to get it sold, but then they'll either do it later or they'll tell a scientist, buddy, look at this cool thing I ran into that I can't figure out. Maybe you can figure it out. Okay? So here's the first thing I'm going to pass around. I want you to play with. And, uh, and I want you to pass it around and play with this guy. See, he's got lots of toys. And now let me explain to you why this issue exists and matters. I have a hypothesis, so now I'm being a scientist, that everybody here was born. And I have a hypothesis that everybody here is going to die. This, this body, whatever happens afterwards, whatever you believe in, find it conventional thinking, you're going to die, right? Does anybody have a problem with these two hypotheses? I've got data for this one, and that you have been born because you're here, and you're no longer pooping on the floor. I can say that because I have a new granddaughter. And every now and then it leaks. So you're saying, Slope, what's he doing? It's going off another tangent. No, I'm an engineer. I observe. That's the scientist in me. But the engineer in me says, how can I design a better diaper that doesn't leak? See, see, see what an engineer does? The scientist will observe, develop a hypothesis. The engineer will do that, but then also say, how can I make it better? That's the, yeah. okay. So the reason you want to be an engineer in terms of an MIT engineer, and not the engineer that just says, all right, man. Let's see, I've got this from the catalog, and this from the catalog, and the catalog says, Put the two together. Okay. Now they're together. You see, they're not really together. See how the Legos I put them so they're not right? Yeah, pass it out and then fix it. <laughs> That's not, some people would say it's good enough, they're connected. A real MIT engineer will say, that doesn't seem really right. Why? This is where the, the, the science of the, uh, in engineering comes about. There's a difference between good enough and really good enough. I'm going to do toys first before we do the rest. So this birth and death issue is really important because you know about here. Click, click, click. You are going to get to the end of your life, and you're going to look back, and you're going to say, holy moly, if I sum up all the time that I just spent Bad, bad, bad. I could have had an extra three weeks of snowboarding. What the hell? So the, the, the magic is when you go to create something, and every time I say, ah, what should you think? Exactly. Always look at opposites. So the magic slash, or the wonder, the happiness, slash pain, are that we have all these Legos, catalogs. There's a theory that the internet is the great wonderment, but it's also the most horrible thing for the 
people who don't have the internet in the world, because those who have it just boom, zoom forward. And this is where this great divide, you know, the wealth divide that stuff is coming from. Because if I have access to the internet and I know how to use it, and you may have access to the internet, but you don't know how to use it, I'm going to wreck you. I'm just going to roll right over you. This is where, you know, the conquistadors come into Central America and they have guns, and a hundred conquistadors with guns wipe out tens of thousands of natives with their happy little spears. Okay? So unless you can do this, you're just a happy little native with a spear. And I've got a machine gun and I'm in a tank. And that machine gun and tank is mathematics or analysis. Because Legos and this stuff, just out of a catalog, it's the crack cocaine of the engineering world. And let me show you a real physics example. I've made more, and I have, I have to admit it, I have a white powder habit. You can't hear that? Oh, I have a white powder habit. And I know that you've heard about this, about old people and senior people, and they make a lot of money and they get into the white powder. You've heard about that, right? Yep. I love pillowboarding. I love going out to the Canadian Rockies and me and my buddies, we get in a helicopter and I get in my snowboard and we'll do 50,000 vertical feet of powder in a day. Well, you thought I was some of the other white powder. I've paid for more hilliboarding trips with this simple little thing. Motor. Shaft on motor. Pulley on shaft. Belt, driving, another pulley, you know, to a screw that drives the nut, and then there's a carriage that goes <laughs> Okay, like trainers and stuff. And you have engineers who make this in the lab, unless it's beautiful look, it's on the front page of the MIT web page, so when it goes Ooh. And Alex goes, teleport. Because they do the crack cocaine and they take what they saw in the catalog and they do without asking why. Without everything I see or do, because I have the training, you have the training, because MIT geeks, and this is what will separate you from the, the, the clutter, from the herd. Because everything I do, I look at it and say, what's the physics? What's the free body diagram? Where are the forces? And here's a belt, and remember torque. What's torque? Yeah. So there's force. So when this belt is create, transferring a torque, there's a force in the belt. Right? There has to be a force uh, pulling, which means that uh, there's a force pulling. And oop, it's bending the shaft, pushing force in the shaft, right? The shaft comes in, you're late. Why are you late? Sorry. Don't be late. I love you, but don't be late. You did, this just cost you one hilliboarding trip the knowledge you've lost means that you won't know how to answer this question, which means you will screw up and you'll have to hire me as a consultant and I go pedal boarding. So I'm waiting for you. Right? Oh. I go, if I hire you as a consultant. Exactly! Consultant. See, she's got it. <laughs> Watch me move over there and come up here because we're passing around the toys. Here's bearings in here. You all have 801. Another thing with engineering and science is an engineer understands how to take the mathematics and turn it into a philosophy, apply it, and then do the actual analysis we need. Okay? So now let me do I need a, a volunteer from the studio audience. Someone big though. Shake hands, right? Glad you your high Alex. And you want me to keep lecturing, you don't get to get away, right? Hold on. Hold that hand. Do not let me get away. Come on. Come on. Go on, grab her. Hold her. Everybody thinks she's got it? She's pretty good. Okay, now we'll do the same. Reciprocity. So she gets a turn, right? So now you try to get away. What's the difference? Related? This is called St. Benet's principle. The most amazing thing that's ever happened in mechanics. It's the principle of characteristic dimensions. The characteristic dimension of this system is 
the risk of your hand size. You can't control me by only having me with one characteristic dimension. But I can control you if I have three to five characteristic dimensions. So, so much in engineering, when you do the analysis, you'll see a curve like this. From performance this and things go woo, and it slowly achieves true happiness. You know, and this is, you'll find that when you typically have something by three to five characteristic dimensions, you can get to the 80 or 90% uh, wonderfulness factor. So what happens here is, see the length of this shaft? The diameter of this shaft, and this is actually drawn to proportion. And where is the force applied with respect to the motor and the bearings that hold the shaft? You see, the force is applied at three to five characteristic dimensions away from where the bearings are that hold the shaft. The force controls the shaft, dominates the shaft, and causes early failure of the shaft and bearing. So whenever I'm out looking at machines or evaluating them, I'm always running through this physics. The philosophy of the physics, what are the characteristic dimensions? What are the free body diagrams? Where are the forces flowing? Forces are like, just pouring a glass of water. So what do you do? This is awful, this is painful. This causes pain. You break the shaft. And you see what happens is that people do production machines, and they're beautiful and wonderful, and everybody says, ooh, that's wonderful, ooh, that's so creative. And they start shipping this stuff, and hundreds of thousands of parts will be made in ships. So now you're talking millions, sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars of stuff is sent, and it's all wrong. It's all coming back for warranty repair. So they won't pay me the consulting rate up front sometimes, usually, to design it properly. But we can go to design services, blah, 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 and we can get it for like one-tenth the price, so why should we pay you? I said, don't worry. You'll be paying me 10 times that later. Oh, yeah, right. These guys use blue slides, and they wear suits and ties. Good, you pay me 100 times more. And when this stuff fails, then they're panicking. So see, no one will pay for good food or go to the health club. But they will pay when you, you're in trouble. This is why doctors earn more money than the gym. So these start failing. They've made millions of them. And now I, they need someone to fix it. So when you're in pain, when you're lying on your back, and you're really uncomfortable, what do you do? Reciprocity. So the first most powerful principle in all of engineering is St. Benet's principle. We just did. This is proportions and spell. That's why cursive writing was invented for engineers. Mm -hmm. And then one, I have the t-shirt, I gotta do this. One over algebra equals ah. Reciprocity, which is Maxwell, and Maxwell's reciprocity actually says, you know, if you have a shaft like this, supported like this, and I push here, and I measure deflection there, I can actually take this force at that point of deflection, and I will get that deflection over there for a linear system. But you can do the philosophy of mathematics and Maxwell's principle of, if it hurts, try the opposite. And by the way, you've got to stop on your side on the way from going from your back to your tummy, so also sit at the intermediate point. Okay, so now, how would you fix that? Yeah. And think about the free body diagram that's happening. Now, I put the hub like that. Here's the belt. I flip this around, extend that. The force is now near. Now the shaft dominates the force, and I don't fail the bearings. And you can do the math, and you can see that the forces on the bearings check with way down. And I no longer have the stress concentration of whatever the key is, the, the, the radial force is flowing this way, and the other direction, the other way would also happen is you have a keyway or a set screw, whatever, in here, the flow of forces is flowing through that stress concentration of the shaft and breaks the shaft off. So I'm also separate. You keep getting finer and finer. So the other philosophy book you need to read is if you give a mouse a cookie. Okay. So this is really what engineering and science in my mind is. It's not this or this, it's this. 
And you do this with, you, with philosophy, keeping the math in mind and making sure that you apply the math when needed or if weirdness happens, if you need to find a really deep, deep data gathering super ultra mega analyst, applied mathematician that you do that. Everybody groovy? So that those parts I just passed around, those are called flexures. And the Legos, everybody played with the Legos? Remember, nothing is infinitely accurate, but Legos go together because if you put all those points together, it's called elastic averaging. Everybody gives a little bit. Okay? And um, so I solve a lot of problems like that for industry. <laughs> and when I solve them, they pay well, and then so I go on crazy vacations. I go snowboarding, uh, like scuba diving. I have this uh, need to, 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 for endorphins, so I, I do long distance events. Um, and okay, so this is called a kinematic coupling. And uh, it's a three legged milking stool. It's thousands of years old. It's a tripod. And these three, three balls go in these grooves. If I tip it up, they'll fall over. Six contact points, or you can have three, three, two, one, tetrahedron, a groove, and a flat. Okay, and there's a magic in here that something is wrong with one of these sides, and we'll see who can just look at it, just thinking of eight to one physics, and right away say, "Oh, that was done wrong." Okay, so let me pass this one. You can feel it. And the, this was one of the, the better, so I teach a class 275, and the first project is we have everybody design something that uses a kinematic coupling. It can be totally privileged. It can be a wine bottle holder. It can be a coffee cup. One guy did a unicycle holder. It's just something that you, you want to actually hold carefully. So you all are in the back, and you want to come up with these because you can pass the toys around more. But these things come out. So play with it in this configuration, okay, where the grooves all point to the center. And then if you rotate the grooves, not even all of them, so like for example, now the grooves are sideways, what happens and why? Okay. And uh, again, I'll remind you to tell you a story about, wait a second, what's going on here? Um, I had a student, he did a doctoral thesis on a, a self-leveling version of these kinematic couplings that has sold now this product. We did a lot of work with Teradyne, Alex Darvlov's company. That's a fun shaggy dog story about he and I met over rubber chicken lunch and got into a huge fight. And um, I was in the lab, my secretary said, this was not Sue, said, you have to be here lunch for dog off from Teradon. So I get there, I'm dressed like this, actually I have my lab filled with hydraulic juice and all my junior faculty and colleagues at the time were all wearing suits and they're all like brown nosing with this old guy at the front of the table who had huge ears. And they were talking about the need for collaboration and teamwork, and they all went, you see, he was saying, oh, collaboration and teamwork are the most important things to find a follow-up on. Yes, sir, yes, sir. So then I didn't say anything. And then, and then this old guy says, Professor Slocum, so what do you think? And I said, I think it's all a little bit of crap. He goes, what do you mean? And I said, you can take 10 engineers working in a brilliant, wonderful team, and they're all a bunch of ignorance, and all they care about is being nice and kind and beautiful to each other, and everyone's afraid to actually say when something is wrong, you will have the space shuttle disaster. Actually, it's the space shuttle, or whatever all these disasters happen. And why do I differ with you? And I said, well, look, you have, you make water picks. You don't know anything about real engineering. I was mad, right? And he goes, God damn it, boom, he slammed the table. It's pteridine, not teledyne. We need semiconductor manufacturing equipment, not water pits. I said, oh, all right. Well, I work in semiconductors, too. But I still think you're wrong. He goes, huh. I said, look, you take your hardest mechanical problem that your teams of happy, pretty people have not been able to solve. And if I can't solve it in 10 minutes of looking at it, I'll buy you dinner wherever you want. And Nam Su, I wrote Brian, and he says, deal. So I went over there, and uh, at Teradyne, they make testers. And here's this big machine. It's called a, a handler. So it's the computer chips come in the handler, and a robot takes the chips and presents them up here. And Teradyne makes these big things that sit on top. It's like a big outside air conditioning thing, meter in diameter, and like this, 1,000 pounds. 
and it jams the chip, because all semiconductor devices are tested 100%. A whole tray of chips up inside this device, little prongs touch the chip, and then you see if the chip is good or not. You do this lots of times, but periodically I take this thing up, off, flip it over, and you flip it over, the test boards are in there, all the little prongs, and you gotta replace this board. And then you gotta take this thing and put it back, and it's gotta be precisely relocated on the handler, otherwise the robot should know where line up up. You say, well, let me just use vision. Because it's only so good enough, because the robot is XY, it can't account for all the tilt stuff. So it takes them about a half an hour to do the realignment. This is about uh, one to two million dollars of equipment. So if you do this three or four hour, three or four changes a day, so if you have one to two hours per day of downtime, non-productive use of equipment that costs this much, how much will you be willing to pay for a system that will knock this one to two hours down in five minutes? <coughs> this is the other thing the engineer does. The other thing the engineer does is look at <coughs> the problem, but analyze what are the true resources I have, not the catalogs, but how much money can I spend to solve the problem? Now, regular engineers don't do that, but the Harvard manager guys do it, and that's why they get paid the big money, because they handle the money, and then they tell you, the engineer, you have, in this case, you better you can solve this for less than $50,000, we will sell an endless amount of it. So I got there, and I look at it, and I said, oh, I see what the problem is. I'm going to use a kinematic coupling for that. And people said, Three balls, three grooves, I can repeat to micron, sub-micron alignment. And there's all this of control balls there, he says, the head of engineering. What's he saying? Is that right? Can you do it? And the guy says, I have no clue. So I pull up uh, at my computer and I show them. I didn't invent this. Uh, James Clerk Maxwell was using these for his optics experiments and the original uh, Maxwell documents and stuff, blah, blah, blah. was saying, these are really cool. I wish I knew how they worked. So I was there. Silly guy at the Bureau of Standards who figured out not only the mathematics of the kinematics, but the contact stresses. You see, the kinematics are really simple, the contact stresses aren't too difficult, but no one had ever taken the two together because opticians had used these things over the years to precisely align. But everybody knows because it's three points contacting, now we're going to do an in class experiment, right? We're, this is what the educationologists tell us we need to do in class hands on learning. Get out your pen or writing instrument. Take it and put the pointy end up to your temple. And come on. Uh, <laughs> anybody else need to do anything? Put, oh, I'm sorry. Put, now push! Push until it hurts. Thank you. Heinrich Hertz, one of the most famous mathematicians, the guy who actually invented frequency. That's why Hertz is called Hertz, H-E-R-S, or H-E-R-Z, it's that Hertz. His railroad friend guy in Germany said, you know, I make, I, I pull trains, and you know, I, I, I add weight to the locomotives, I can pull more, and then I dent the tracks. How much weight can I put on? Now, let's use reciprocity. Instead of pushing with a pointy end, push with a round smooth end. Can you push harder before it hurts? He's the guy who figured out the math behind it. That's why it's called the Hertz contact stress analysis. So I, I figured out how to take, I wrote the spreadsheet, we put it out for free, how you design those things so you can have infinite ginormous loads and never hurt them. So over the, I taught the engineers how to do it there. Over the next week, they built a prototype, and, and Alex bought me the most wonderful dinner and then wrote a check to MIT for $20 million. The lunch that we had was he was checking us out to see if we were worthy of him endowing a chair. I got that chair. That's why the administration doesn't want to kill me. It's make <laughs> yeah. This turned into a doctoral thesis from like Chu when I got graduate students, because then they got greedy and nice. They said they want these things to be servo controlled to just. They've sold over 10,000 of these things now at 50 grand a pop. What's 10,000 times? This is, they still sell them. Patent's still valid, it's a huge seller. What's 10,000 times 50,000? 
10 times 10 to the third times 50 times 10 to the third makes 500 times 10 to the sixth. 500 million dollars of kinematic couplings have been sold in the last 10 years. That's, that's cool. And the other thing is, that's only $50,000. People will buy these. You can only buy these if you buy this tester. And this is a million dollar tester. So it's now being used. It, now it's like, you know, if you want this feature, you've got to buy our tester. So this is if you give a mouse a cookie, a mouse a roar, the inverted pyramid. Um, everybody, everybody see the power of not just putting Legos together, but the philosophy and doing the mathematics and then optimizing. And, and, and always, the, the key in mechanical engineering or anything is constraints. And let me show you how we, the ultimate form, is when you look at the Hertz contact equations, point rollers, this is a point contact. This is actually a half meter diameter ball. This is also asking the question, look at the contact line there, of, you can imagine that if you take a ball that's this big and you put it on the surface and you push, it'll hurt quickly. But if the ball was this big, it'd take a lot more load, right? But it still only touches the point. So that's great big giant ball, any living contact point. So you take the ball and you chop this and this and you bring it down and it looks like a canoe bottom. There's some other interesting math behind this in terms of, yeah, but if you rock it, it only has two lines that on the V, this is a contact zone. If it's too much misaligned, this contact zone goes to the edge and you get what's called edge loading. So you have to model about how much misalignment you get. And this is where, this is the danger of catalogitis. That's what I call it. It gives you a terrible rash. And I go, oh, I mean, sometimes it goes scuba diving instead. Um, when people get catalogitis, they haven't done any analysis of what are the limits of what it is. This is the example we showed. Okay. So uh, whenever you have something that's super ultra wonderful, my God, this is too good to be true. It is too good to be true. The mathematics is your your sob, your bottom of the Okay. Now, having verbal all that, I want to launch into. I think it's irrelevant because the Earth was born. And it's going to die. The question is, where is it going to die? And I think it's happening very fast. I'm a diver, a scuba diver. Coral bleaching is now 20% worldwide this year. Glaciers I routinely would drive my board on in Canada are all gone. Glacier National Park, actually within five to 10 years, no more glaciers. It would just be dirt national park. Okay? And uh, I think human hubris is the problem. And you're going to fix it. So let me show you how I think so. Why I have ultimate faith this can happen. So when I say, what is an engineer? I think we are the creator of the future. The future may be death, because we built the machines that built the bombs that are going to totally annihilate the planet, no problem. Or super happy Eden. That's us, okay? So people sometimes say, what do I do as an engineer? I think I gave you a little hors d'oeuvres there. Um, I'm a mechanical psychotherapist. I just listen for complaining. Some ten, I got to find this article, like uh, Hoffman Mechanics, I think it was. There was this lady who was the head of Stanley Toolworks R&D division. And she's the one who came out with a Fat Mac. Anybody here who's like, took Stanley Toolworks, like the Fat Mac brand of tools, really great cool tools. And, and I gotta get this. And uh, the, the, the journalist was interviewing her, and the first question is, well, you know, what are you as a woman, you know, doing hand tools, you know, man's carpentry? And she was really good. She said, no, I was, my dad was a, a, a construction business, and I'm always on the site, and I'm a carpenter and stuff. So that's the first, next first lesson. Whenever you're confronted, and I use the example of the, the gender thing there, but it happens all the time with all kinds of other things. Whenever you're confronted with somebody who is uh, a North Flat, you know, just you can either dig in and fight back, or you can use your martial arts training. The traditional person, when they, someone comes at you with a fist right to the face, like, yeah, I can take it, Dunk. hit me again. When someone comes at you, you redirect their energy and use it against them. 
when you come at me, I'm just going to take your energy and make the pull and then bring you down to the ground with my knee into your chest. And the full force will break your ribs and kill you, which is how you deal with a dog that attacks you. Um, she handled it beautifully. She says, I listen for the customers. Not the, hey, how the fuck are you? But the, God did jack. So she listens for the cuss words with anger. And then she knows there's a need for a new product. Isn't that cool? And then you apply the math. So that's what I do. Everything I do, you, you try to understand the philosophy of the physics, and then the mathematics of it, apply reciprocity to look at the inverse to the problem, and do you have a solution? You ask yourself, the limits. Is there a kinematic solution or an elastic averaging solution? You know, the three-point kinematic couplings, or is there a whole bunch of points? And, and your goal is to maximize happiness for everybody. You can't always get there, but that's what you want to do. So um, I'm really worried about the planet. Um, I, I, my personal life, in terms of beliefs, is my person. I will, I'll share with you, I'm a very spiritual person. I love the planet. I love people. Uh, I love all flavors of things. Um, and I think we only have one planet. And to think we're going to leave this planet for a better planet after we've killed this one is silly. Because that just means history says we'll kill the next one. So I'm going to just fix this one. Um, I also know physics doesn't give a damn. You know? The space shuttle should not have fallen. That was not nice. One silly little piece of foam should not bring down that giant machine. And reality is hard. Make sure you imagine that. And we're, we humans are just a blip on the planet. Blip. Which was it last five, ten thousand years of quote modern humans? Total blip. And we may be gone tomorrow. So uh, after 9/11, I was in Egypt for a conference on materials and design in November. We were originally 150 people. We rented a, a Nile River boat. It was you know, the morning to tour rides, and then the afternoon was hot. You know, we had our conference, and everyone canceled. I called my friend El Sayed, the guy down at Rutgers, at 12. What's happening? He says, everyone, I got an email. My inbox is full. Everyone's canceled. I was the only white guy in this conference. Only six people came. Anyway. It's fantastic. And I walked all over back alleys. I met the most wonderful people. <laughs> I can't believe these morons did this. It's not as far. And so I did a lot of thinking, and that was my change in life, 9-11, in terms of what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. I'm going to fix the planet again. And um, I, did, I started with the numbers. History, Vietnam, original thing Vietnam, and the end, uh, what's the space? Uh, Mitzi, I think it was, wrote the book, like, wow, we knew this was silly. So if you, if you look at money and cast forward what war costs, totally agnostically, don't, I'm not going to say whether they deserve it or not, it's just total agnostic. I calculated back then it would cost a decade and two trillion dollars is what would be spent. That's all. And I wrote my congressman and everyone else, and, and you need to write your representatives what you think, and not just to complain, you need to write them with rational thinking and ideas and the numbers to back it up before they do stupid things. Okay, so you have no right to complain unless you are proactive. <coughs> And I was told very nicely, I still got the letter somewhere, I think it was from Bob Smith when I sent out, I live in New Hampshire, no, 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 these 30 or 40 billion, two or three years, and they're going to pay us all back stops and we'll have peace in the Middle East. So it was, I was right, uh, it was 10 years and we spent two trillion dollars, and even a bigger mess, so I asked, now, what are you going to do with the next two trillion dollars? Because what I said back then was, if you take four dollars for installed watt of renewables, solar, wind, and that, that's a lot of money actually, $4 a lot. You could have 500 gigawatts of CO2 free 24 seven electric power. That's actually the instantaneous average consumption in the United States. <coughs> we could have said to the rest of the world, we don't know what it did to, we did to piss you off. And we're not admitting anything. All we know is, is that, you know what? Instead of spending the next 10 years and spending 10 trillion, 10, 2 trillion on war, we're just gonna not need you at all. We're gonna make you irrelevant. And we're going to sell that technology all over the world to make oil irrelevant everywhere. That would be that one that would really scare them and piss them off because there's nothing that makes a person more scared than being irrelevant. <coughs> Do you know how Stalin, all those waterboarding, 
babies. Uh, my uncle went through Stalin. You know how they tortured my uncle? They take you in a big barn, it's a pile of dirt, and everyone's given a wheelbarrow. You fill up your wheelbarrow, you take it to the other end of the barn, you dump the wheelbarrow. You fill it up again and you come back. And you go back and forth, continually doing this inane thing, and it will drive people crazy. You start screaming, and then the last man standing, you can live. I don't believe. You know what he was doing? He told me he was doing? He was designing construction machinery. How would I do this? And this is before computers. How would I make a machine to do this? He, he was a designer of transfer lines for automated assembly of cars in Detroit many years later. Isn't that interesting? So, so what do we do next to Detroit? You're going to fix it, right? So here's, yeah. uh, we posted all these slides, and you know, there's all this stuff, blah, 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 oil we still needed. I'm one of the inventors of the most best revolutionary drill bits to go hot, deep drilling, and, and, and all of drilled them. I solved the problem of I got rid of the seals. You know why piston on propellers? God knew there'd be a problem with the seals. Art, art, art. So the moral of the story is I get rid of the elastomers, and these are drill bits that go really deep. And the way you get horizontal drilling, which is where all the fracking comes from, is as the drill bits rotating, and I want to go down, as the drill bits rotating, this little flapper thing here goes up and pushes the bit down. Or if you want to go left, if the drill is rotating, this hydraulic signal pushes it, and the hydraulic valve goes and pushes it to the left or the right. But when you go deep, it gets hot, and the elastomers, the rubber seals, die. So it doesn't last anymore. I figured out how to get rid of all the rubber. My colleagues that I was originally hired for, they were hiring the elastomer gods to figure out rubbers that will last at high temperature. So anyway, that's another whole engineering story. No rubber. And it works far better. It doesn't wear out. Cheaper, too. Um, and then there's the Brittany effect. Oops. <laughs> it's going to happen again. So I have a doctoral student, and we have a neat new company. Basically, so I was a member of Secretary Chu's team on the Deepwater Horizon, and uh, when I have three sons, but I have three nieces, and this is what happens when they leave my house, they take showers, and all that long hair comes out. Anybody has long hair will know if this happens. And we designed a machine to send wire into the blowout preventer, create a hairball. We didn't do it at the Deepwater Horizon, there's a whole bunch of that. It's another long story, but it's a neat new company, we have great funding, and we're in Houston, former doctoral student, and it's the hairball generator because it will happen again. But this time, we can go fix it right away. And um, so that's just got to do with energy and saving the planet. Solar, see, so I'm still a believer in, in, in oil. You can't get rid of it, but you want to get it and do it responsibly. And I always look for the, where the money is. On solar, you may have said about solar thermal and big towers and everything. And I look at this stuff and I say, too many parts. I'm really snowboarding. And so I get my goal is to get rid of parts because I listen to complaints and then I go and I talk to the plant managers who say, Arr! and the problem with the big solar thermal towers is they have all these tubes and the physicists haven't figured this one out yet, but at night the sun goes down and it's dark. So things are really hot during the day. Arr! And at night, boom, they draft. So when they do that, Arr! the mechanical solid things deep, break and die. No problem. I make them thicker, add more heat tape, and see if you get a mouse to cook So let's just get rid of them. And let's just let the sunlight beam directly into a container of hot salt, because hot salt is actually clear. The sunlight goes in, it's absorbed through the volume. You can't hurt molten salt. So a big part of what we're doing is these new molten salt receivers. Big project with Mazdar. Do a lot of work with, uh, uh, this was undersea energy storage, big concrete spheres on the bottom of the ocean or pipes that will be used to anchor the wind turbines, and you pump the water out of them. And pumped hydro, everybody understands the concept of that, NGH, potential energy, lake up high, water runs down through a turbine. When you want to store energy, you pump the water up. This is just pump the water out instead of up. Never gone anywhere, still too expensive, but this leads to my afro. So listening to people, they say, Renewable energy is too expensive. You know, I can just burn coal in Utah, so therefore it doesn't matter because, you know, I'm in California and I like smoking dope and having clean air and driving my limousine and being real liberal, too. I don't have to worry about uh, pollution. I burn coal in Utah. 
for the Germans. We will not have nuclear power. It's dangerous. We are going to turn it off right now. Fortunately, we have France, who we can buy our power from, even the solar is dark, and they have nuclear power still. So the, the, the complaining I'm hearing is renewables are too expensive. Oh shit, we don't have any water to drink because we're killing the planet. And the climate's changing in El Nino and blah, blah, blah. No problem, we have desalination, which means we can burn coal in Utah to get electricity to make our fresh water. I have a lot of friends who live in Utah, so they're not going to happen. So I listen for pole zero cancellation, and I find the following. I look at the physics, and, and check this out. When the, when, when the Earth was created, someone was really smart. Here's the ocean. And they knew that people who would listen and actually think about math would realize that during the day, you want to be on the beach having happy, fun times, right? I mean, look, I grew up in LA, I can say it. And you know what? Sometimes I don't want to go to the beach. I want to go snowboarding. So I'm going to put big mountains right near the beach within 10 miles. And you know, um, I only have five days to create everything because on the sixth day, I've got to make uh, Walmart, Amazon, and McMaster. <laughs> so I'm going to have to cut a few corners here. And uh, the big t I'm going to design fluid mechanics such that the optimum pressure is 500 atmospheres. I'm sorry, 500 meters of height, which is 50 atmospheres of pressure for the fluid in a lake to run down through a turbine, spin the turbine, and make electricity. Okay, so that's your optimal head height for a hydroelectric system is about 500 meters, 1,500 feet. But I don't have enough time to, to shoot, also do the chemistry thing for letting them to do reverse osmosis because then they're really going to screw up the planet and cause the temperature to go haywire. Um, let's see, you know what? Uh, we're going to want to have a membrane that they can run seawater past at high pressure so fresh water goes through. Damn, how do I design? Uh, well, you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and make the optimal pressure for reverse osmosis to be this also. Let's cut some corners because I don't need time. So that's the little magic I found. The pressure you need for reverse osmosis is the same pressure you want to use for this pump hydro. So that means that in these areas where you have beautiful coasts but no water, that if you pump your water up into a reservoir here, when you have ele excess electricity from your solar or wind, and then you run it down through your desalination plant and your water turbine, you can get two birds for one stone symbiotic relation. And as an engineer, see, the world is full of people who just think, oh, these are wonderful. Yeah. What you want to do also is then put a, write a spreadsheet or a MATLAB or whatever you'd like to use of the physics. Does that show up? Yeah. And, and that, that's really small. Let me make it a little bigger. And what we calculated is Say I want to provide electricity and fresh water for three million people, one third of LA. I'm going to give you two kilowatts of average power per person and 500 liters of water, which is more than enough for all your needs. When you run through all the numbers of all this stuff, doing the modeling and the efficiency and the process, and you, you do your, you check that you check out your wonderful brilliant ideas because nine times out of ten, my wonderful brilliant ideas are. You know, it's because I'm a farmer and I need, I, need, I need manure to fertilize my crops. But this one was a real ripe fruit, it turns out. So it, look, if I make a, a lake which is two kilometers by two kilometers and 30 meters deep, that holds all the water up high I need to supply all the fresh water and all the electricity for three million people. I can solve California's problem. And if California doesn't want to do it, you go back to this. So basically,
basically I can make renewables economical and better than burning coal, actually compete. We went around the world using a higher resolution than Google Earth. And, and this happens to be Southern California. And these are these lake sites. And these are in the mountains. The red indicates prime natural location. And there's no one who lives there at all. These are, quote, state forests. And so the idea is, OK, if we take this little piece of land and make a lake, OK, the uh, inverted square uh, back aardvark may not be happy. But that means that we won't have to burn all this coal in Utah and kill the rest of the planet, because we can get water and power for all of LA. As a matter of fact, if you go south near Tijuana in Mexico, they even better sites. So we can help address the immigration problem, not by killing all these goddamn foreigners or building a fence. Yeah. Just mean that they don't want to come here, because there's better opportunities where there are. Because we're going to create the water power infrastructure system in Mexico business unit with it. I'm working with some really, really rich alums now alums in Mexico to actually do this. So, and then we'll sell electricity and water to the gringos instead of exporting our workers. See, we're using reciprocity. I'm an immigrant, so I can say this thing. My family was all wiped out by Stalin, except for a few of my, my mother and my mother and stuff. So I can also say that. The goal is to take the resources that are out there and optimize them and make goodness from them. And it turns out that what we've done, we went all the way around the world. There's all these sites around the world that can do this. We call it the A-index, the Afro. And why is it the Afro? It's the Advanced Pumped Hydro Reverse Osmosis System, A-P-H-R-O. I like doing acronyms. So my buddy Mark Graham, who is a black fella, He's also a former graduate student of mine, brilliant doctoral thesis guy, designs mm -hmm. medical products. That's a rap group. He goes, hey, Abby, that's pretty funny, man. It's Afro, man. And I'm like, oh, yeah. But we wrote a poem. So the other part of this is, as an engineer, is you got to figure out, because you see a handful of people who in power who don't want this because they own the money and the conventional things, they'll fight you. So I can block them with my face, or I can realize that in LA there are one to two million people who, most of them of color, with no jobs and no future and no hope, but they have each has one vote. So um, we also went with this. Uh, oops, hold on a second. And we wrote a poem. Go with this. We call it World First. So we wrote the poem, and uh, Mark has done the rap. And let's see if it'll play. So, I'm not exactly a, a rap fan, but I'm a fan of poetry and libretto. Rap is just modern opera. sell it to the people. That's the other part of what an engineer has to do. You can't just solve a problem and say, hey, that's cool, dude, and then walk away. you got to ask yourself the question, what, how does your product brought into society, how do you, if it's really that good, how do you work with the people who have the skill set that complement yours? You know, the, the, the marketing people, the sales people, the business people, who you often hear us like to nag on and make fun of, but they make fun of us. Um, and work as a team to really make your brilliant idea actually do something. Because the world is no shortage of brilliant ideas. The world is really, really short of people who can solve a problem and bring the problem to, to market and actually have your solution useful to help make the planet better, OK? That's a key, a key thing that engineers also do. We don't just solve problems. We make, bring the problem, actually, you see it be 
the solution to use it. Okay, so I'm done, and I'm right on time. Oh, I have one other thing I wanted to say. Oops, sorry. Yo, come back. It turns out that, and I'm sorry for the eye chart, um, the place, uh, uh, Chile, Peru, to the whole west coast we can fix. China, huge problem with water. It turns out that uh, we can do all the water and power needed for a big chunk of China, including Beijing, uh, up, up in that corner up there. And there's another place in the world that has the potential of need for jobs, and they don't have a lot of water. A lot of sun. Where's that place? Ah, the Middle East. Have you guys heard of it? And it turns out the places with the highest A index, the Afro index, is actually Iran. Iran is horribly dry, but on the Caspian Sea, the mountains are just perfect for doing this. And the United Arab Emirates, so we, we've got in Morocco, which is beautiful. <coughs> So we're, our, our, what we're doing is with this paper we sent off, Nature came back, we printed it in the Nature, the, the energy, the renewables, and they said this is too pedantic, there's not enough science in it for us. There's an IEEE renewables journal we sent it off to, including with the poem. I think the poem is what pissed off the Nature editor. <laughs> this is our conclusion. We had a paper like this once before and the editor is actually about the, um, so where our goal is, this is, the, this is what I'm going to do for the next few years, is uh, mostly working with alums. Some of the Department of Energy guys are now getting excited about this. And uh, how do we go around the world where you need power, water, jobs, and build this new societal infrastructure of creating jobs that have value for people locally, and they're not busy make work jobs, they're good high quality from maintenance people all the way to the engineers that need to run the plant and design the factory to do the automated design and manufacturing and assembly of the solar cells to put on the roof to create the renewable energy, to power the turbines, to pump the water, to make the fresh water, to create happiness in the world. That's what we're gonna do. You're gonna do. Okay, so the future's bright. Or you can go and design nuclear weapons, which would also be pretty cool, because then you can get rid of everything you want. Okay, let's thank Professor Slocum. Now, one more question. I was going to ask, uh, you mentioned the paper of uranium collection. What's the uranium used for? Ah, nuclear power. I'm a staunch advocate of nuclear power. And let me show you something. What about the waste? You're going to hurt the waste. The waste is terrible. Right? Um, for the really big problems, you give a moose a muffin. <laughs> That's a cookie for a normal problem. And uh, offshore wind, we have a system for collecting nuclear or from uranium in the seawater. It's a big, long program in DOE. has many years of problems are getting really good. From there, it turns out in the APRO system, you have such a high flow rate of water that you can put those polymers there. And about 5 to 10% of the energy that the APRO system is operating on in renewables, uh, about 5 to 10% of that value will be in uh, candy and additional energy in the form of uranium collected from the seawater, which can then go to power your nuclear plant. The nuclear plants would, would also be used in conjunction with the APRO. Pumped hydro machines have been around for eons, originally actually for nuclear. If you run your nuclear power plant full power all the time, and at night you don't need the power, so you pump the water up the hill. So during the day you have the output power of the plant plus the output power of the hydro. Um, and, and I'm a staunch fan of nuclear power, if you do it with oil. So in the 60s, it was recognized and proposed that the way you should deal with nuclear waste, you should cite the, the unfortunately, nuclear power plants became um, political union footballs, you know, job things. And there's the collusion between unions and lawyers and environmentalists, that if we just keep the lawsuits going long enough, the plant will take five times as long to build as it would if we just built it. So that means more jobs for everybody for longer. The, the proper way to do the nuclear plant is you, you find an area where the geologic strata is such that deep, hard rock, you, here's your nuke, you drill down, and you go down 10,000 feet in the hard rock, two kilometers, one meter diameter, 
And in this zone here, I can put all the spent nuclear fuel that will ever be created from this nuke. So instead of collecting it all and shipping it all to Utah to mix with their coal or whatever the hell they're going to put in Nevada, you, you send it back down to the earth, and it's so deep there's nothing down there. We know that from the petroleum industry. And we can now drill this. You couldn't drill this in the 60s. And the other little key factor is all new nuclear plants anyway. You won't, the, the goal is to run things hotter with the molten salt so you don't need the cooling water. So you run what's called a, a supercritical CO2 cycle. But we can still do this now with enough plants or have this is the way repositories should be built. All made possible by the oil industry and deep drilling bits, which now don't give a damn about, because when you drill this deep, it gets really hot. It could be three, 400 degrees uh, centigrade down here. Pretty cool, huh? So we can solve the nuclear waste problem. Please listen, listen for the whining. Uh, wind power, too expensive. So the other thing you want to do, and you all can leave if you want to, but uh, I, I remember I listened to the complaining. It's too expensive! Okay, let's figure out why it's too expensive. Because it costs too much. <laughs> huh? So you go and you, there's plenty of data, and you look at the, the things like this, and um, and these pie slices represent where the costs are. It's a bunch of you know, little ones. So I look at this and I say, oh, dude, okay, this is the biggest slice of pie. I'm the big guy. I, I do an insane amount of, you know, the, the endurance marathon. I, say, I can eat whatever I want. What's that? And, and you look, and this is the whole. It turns out that 30% of the cost of a big wind turbine is the whole. Now, everyone knows if you're an academic and you have to have lots of mathematics and blah, 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 and publish fundamental papers on incomprehensible analysis of equations, yada, yada, you work on gearboxes or inverters or any of that really cool stuff that's got thousands of parts. Yeah. I look at the poll and say, huh, why is it so expensive? And why it's so expensive is because when they ship the pole, they have to go under a bridge, so the maximum diameter could be four and a quarter meters. Which means that if it's this tall and you're pushing with the mega newton of wind force on it, and you're only four and a quarter meters, you know, a very simple mechanics calculation says that your wall thickness here is basically three inches of steel. And any steel over one inch plate, you pay a premium on the thickness, plus you have to do multiple pass welding. So if you give mouse some cookies, your costs start to go through the roof. So then you ask yourself the question, well, what would it be if I had only had to use one inch steel? which is cheap. See, the MIT's mascot is the beaver, but I think you should have a friend. The, the co-mascot is the baby chicken. Cheap. <laughs> For the cost. Oh, look at that. That was good. And it turns out to go to seven meters, you can use one-inch steel. And seven meters tapering up to three meters at the top, you use one-third as much steel. Period. And it, 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 Professor Eager, I'm sure, told you that basically, in the end, it's a commodity and they go by the weight. Tell me the weight and the alloy, and I'll tell you the cost. Excavators, how much do you think a 100,000 pound excavator worth costs? If I go to the CAT website and look up, I forgot the number, 100,000 pound excavator. How much are you going to pay for the excavator? 250,000. Well, it's about 500 grand, $5 a pound. Isn't that cool? Construction equipment, about five bucks a pound. But a pole is 75 cents a pound. Right. <coughs> so, but we use one third less steel, so we save 30%. No, but I mean, they sell 12 transmission tower poles by the pound. Right, and we'll and sell it. 50, I just saw the contract in another case, $1,500 per ton. Yeah, and, we, and we're just going to use one-third as much material. So we don't, I, I totally agree with you. Well, but those towers in that other contract, 94,000 metric, 94, metric tons. So now if you're talking about 30,000 30, metric tons that you're going to save, you can start multiplying that out on $1,500. And you come to about a half a billion dollars. Right, we, we're lowering the cost of wind energy by 10%, which is probably going to be the tipping point. And the way you do it is, you see, we invented a way of how to weld the spiral weld. The spiral pipe has been welded straight pipe forever. I grew up in the offshore industry. No one has ever figured out how to make it, there was ever a need to make a tapered spiral weld pipe. So we invented that process, patents have issued, we got the funding, we started the company. 
we designed the machine, a lot of mathematics in the machine, starting with the philosophy and blah, blah, blah. We built the machine, turned the button, it worked first time. Hey, yeah, physics works, good stuff. Uh, we're in Colorado now, and now we're doing the full-scale machine. We're getting ready to move in the big factory. We're expanding like bananas. Uh, it's really a lot of fun. And the idea is, is that you bring, this is the inversion problem. We're not going to make pieces of the pole in a factory and bring the pieces to the site and assemble them. We're going to bring the factory in pieces to the site, assemble the factory, and then now just squirt out poles of the diameter we want. Then use one third of the steel. And it's cheaper to truck in that tonnage of steel because it's cheaper to truck in flat plate that's been pre-cut than these big giant pieces of shams which then you have to hold together. The less stuff I have to do, the more time I can go snowboarding. Because you know what? I was born, I'm gonna die. I almost died last on Saturday. That was pretty exciting. I was going downhill in, 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 in Kona and it was fierce wind. And I was near 50 miles an hour on this one downhill. And then doosh, the wind took me over in the other lane. But fortunately there was no traffic. It was really exciting. Oh my gosh. That's really cool. Okay, so that's also what we do. And that's what I like to do is I like to start companies that do stuff like that. Cool. Yes, ma'am. You had mentioned that there was something wrong with one of these that you were messing around. Yes, did you figure it out? No, but I just wonder, it'll bother me. Okay, so let's ask ourselves, what is the functional requirement of that thing? That thing is to locate this thing and make it really step it strong in all dimensions, right? So, and well, you can be the volunteer for my studio audience. You want me to bring this up? Yeah, sure. Okay, so you see how much fun I have? I really, really like doing this stuff. That's the other thing. As an engineer or an accountant or whatever you do, like this company, the company that I do is that I'll find that the accountants look at me and say, you're kind of like me here. Oh, I would just love figuring out how much money you spent. And that's good. Everyone should follow their passion because there's enough room in the world for everybody to have to execute their passion. Okay, so um, if you flip it over and we play with this side, remember that other one that went passed around? Did everybody play with the wood one to see how when the grooves aren't aligned right, it spins? Okay, so when you go to rotate this side, can everybody see that the center of rotation is in the, in the, 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 in the tetrahedron? No. So you're going you're gonna to prevent me from rotating by pushing on this arm, right? Okay. So I can't. Now, I want you to come here and stand closer because we're good friends now. Now, at that, and now with your arm at an angle, now prevent me from rotating. You see the angle? How it's not so much of a mechanical advantage? See how I can rotate her? Where's the groove? Which, which direction should the groove be in? R cross F. You see that the groove should be pointing directly to tetrahedron. So the resistance force would be the lever arm would be optimized. That's why. See, it's not optimal. It works, but it's not optimal. So a company will release a product with an error, with something like this in it, it'll be okay. They'll want better performance because some, some customers are complaining about things. Well, you know, it's not as good as they thought it would. They'll call me and say, what's going on? And I'll look at these things, and this is the kind of thing I look for, these constraints, our processing and stuff. And you can spot these things pretty quick. I'll scribble it, and then I'll go to their drawing, and then I'll say, okay, for all future parts, or you can place this one if you want, and here's the tetrahedron, here's your flat, and here's the groove, uh, you're going to change it so the groove is oriented like that. I have done this. I can't say the other word because it's 
politically correct to say asshole. Some parental penetrator will come after you. All right, so are we, are we happy now? Do we, do we jive apply? Please understand. Okay, so I'll go, go forward and renew vigor. When you're sitting in class and some inane professor is barking on about some god awful boring theory, just ask yourself, how would I use that to make what I'm working on better? And if, they, if you can't answer it, you ask the question, excuse me, how can I use this theory to make more optimal? Have a fun day, I know I will. <laughs>